The peace of God be with you all. Our scripture today is from the book of Acts and recounts the apostles' meeting with Simon the sorcerer. So listen to the word of God. When Simon saw that the spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry, because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. This is the word of our Lord. Amen. One moment, please. Please pray with me. Thank you, Lord, for this glorious day and for gathering this fine group of folks as a church family in your name. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. We had a staff meeting a few months ago, and we talked about stewardship at this meeting. And the following day, uh, I was reading the book of Acts, and I came upon this text, and I sent Roger an email, kind of a joke. Hey, Roger, this would be a great stewardship text. And he wrote back, why don't you do it? <laughs> After prayerful consideration, a lot of prayerful consideration, I agreed to give this message. Now, I say message because I really don't think I am qualified as someone who is not an ordained uh, minister of the word and sacrament to give a sermon. I see it more as a testimony, kind of my thoughts on the subject of stewardship. And I offer this disclaimer. The opinions expressed are those of Josh Whitmer, not necessarily of Highland Presbyterian Church, the Presbytery of Gonegal, or the General Assembly of the PCUSA. <laughs> so when I read this text, it seemed to me that Simon was offering money to the church, expecting something specific in return. Kind of, yeah, but what's in it for me? Uh, this struck me as an inauthentic motive for giving to the church. And it led me to muse about what stewardship means to us as Christians and how we can give more abundantly. I'm really anxious to get to this text, but I'm a little behind on my thank you notes. Do you guys mind if I write a couple thank you notes here before we get going? All right. Thank you, Westboro Baptist Church for helping me decide which church not to give to. <laughs> we didn't practice this. Thank you, Belgrove Missionary Baptist Church, the Lighthouse Church, and Emmanuel Southern Baptist Church for using the resources of your congregation to call a pastor who can really speak the lingo and connect with those millennials. My favorite is, life is cray cray, Jesus is the way way. <laughs> and thank you, Simon the Sorcerer. Wait a second, how'd that get in there? Simon the Sorcerer for teaching us about giving with impure motives and helping us to understand how to do it right. We'll have to practice that one next time. Amen. So in our scripture passage today, this dude Simon offers Peter and John money to give him the ability to lay on hands and to give people the Holy Spirit. Simon was a professional sorcerer, which back in those days was, meant he made his living um, amazing the people of Samaria with his uh, magic. And according to the Bible, this magic was inspired by Satan. Um, Simon was, 
asking for power, maybe power, maybe more earning power, or perhaps power to do better tricks. And even though Simon had been baptized a couple of verses earlier, Peter and John rebuked him, basically saying, to heck, I said heck, to heck with you and your money. Simon's heart was not right with God. He needed to repent. He was still enslaved to bitterness and iniquity. He was still in his sin and not yet converted. Sin is something we talk a lot about, I'm sorry, that we don't talk a lot about in the Presbyterian church, especially during, during stewardship messages. Uh, you don't say, you are a terrible person, give us money. <laughs> Although uh, St. Nicholas Episcopal, Episcopal <laughs> Church tried that once, I don't know how it turned out. But as sinners, we believe the good news of the gospel, that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. How do you put a dollar figure on that? God does not put a price on it. His love and forgiveness are free. We just have to learn how to accept them. So how do we respond to this extravagant love? How could we possibly thank our Lord and Savior for such a priceless gift? Jesus was all about giving, feeding, healing, forgiving. Many of us, instead of being here to give, are actually here to receive, to be fed and healed, to obtain salvation. Mark Roberts says, haven't I come to Jesus primarily for what I can receive from him? Don't I continue to ask him for my own blessings? Aren't I eager to share in Jesus' glory, but to avoid the fellowship in his sufferings? Like Simon the sorcerer, we give expecting something in return. What's in it for me? As an example, I'm going to give a couple examples of my what's in it for me throughout this message. But my first example is when the Highland Scholarship Committee was formed, we had a discussion at one of our meetings. Chairperson Allison Freeman suggested that we sponsor Matt Wilcox in his studies. My first reaction was, if we help Matt get an education, then he'll be ordained, then he'll get called to another church, and we will lose our investment. <laughs> I'm sure some of you had that same thought. What's in it for me? I'll never forget Allison's response. She said, it is our duty as Christians to prepare people to serve the Lord, it's the Lord's decision how to use them. But how do we learn to give like this? Uh, when the giving to get kind of exchange or trade model is so ingrained in our, in our culture, can we expect something in return and still give authentically? Amazingly, when we give for the right reasons, God blesses us with physical, emotional, and spiritual benefits. A wealthy philanthropist was asked, you give away so much money, how do you have any money left? He said, I shovel it out, and God keeps shoveling it back in. Just that God has a bigger shovel. <laughs> God does not reward greed. But I feel that he does offer rewards here in the physical world. For instance, our offerings keep this church running. We have this extraordinary facility called Highland Presbyterian Church. We get to use it for worship, for weddings, for concerts. It's a huge evangelistic tool, inviting people in to hear the good news. When we were building it, one of our primary functions we foresaw was the spiritual growth of our youth. And although they never expected to set foot in the TYC or the gym, many of our senior, senior members gave generously to the capital campaign. In this way, giving also offers us strength and the power to change lives. Authentic giving has an emotional value as well. Um, selfishly, <laughs> there's another example. We want others to know that we pay our way, that we carry our load. My family gives via direct deposit, so we don't put anything in the basket when it comes by on Sunday morning. Selfishly, I once wished aloud that Highland had I gave via direct deposit cards <laughs> to put in the basket 
in lieu of a check so that everybody would know that I give. <laughs> Clearly violating Jesus' admonition in Matthew 6, 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men in order to be noticed by them. When we give, we know that we have done the right thing, and we can see that our giving in action, and we can see it through the work of the church. I mean, look around you at all the people doing great work in this, uh, in this church for the kingdom of God. Instead of just an ego boost, God's emotional reward is the peace and the joy and the knowledge that we have done our part. Spiritually, God rewards us with righteousness when we give. When Jesus told the young man in Matthew 19, 24, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. I personally think he was talking about the idolatry of money in the rich man's heart and the rich man's inability to give freely. God does not hoard his blessings. He's extremely generous. In our generosity, we can experience this righteousness. And what could be more righteous than helping to accomplish the great commission, the risen Christ's order to spread his teachings to all nations of the world. That's what the church does. So we are to give cheerfully. And there is something actually in it for us, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. So what forms shall our gifts take? How can we give like God? And what do, we, what do you get a God who has everything? God does not need a new iPhone. I'm sure every Presbyterian has heard a stewardship sermon and knows the three T's of giving, but it never hurts to be reminded of what we are asked to give. Time. I personally believe that giving of our time is one of our most generous gifts. Our time here on earth is finite. The more time we give to God, it's an increased percentage of our lives. This gift of time can be informal, like prayer, or praise and worship, singing worship songs that give us words to express our adoration for our God. Or it can be given in the currency of work, like the hard work of the Mars Hill mission trip people, work that makes people warmer and safer and drier. What's in it for you? Ask any one of these people that are going to be commissioned here from Mars Hill, ask them when they return, and I guarantee you they will be able to tell you how your gift of work and time blesses them. The more I do here at Highland, the more I see the amazing talents of our congregation. Um, the word talent kind of has an artistic connotation, like the talented and awesome worship team of musicians. By the way, let's hear it for that awesome worship team of musicians. Um, but of course, Talents come in all flavors, from professional skills like accounting or carpentry to personal skills like patience and listening. I know everybody in this room is good at something, and I'm sure that God can use your special skills. Uh, Mary Beth Eberly is coming to Mars Hill, but she's not coming to swing a hammer. She's coming to use her talent of congeniality to share the good news with the people of rural North, Car North Carolina. And I believe that when we sincerely give our best in the talents that we have, God makes us even better at what we do. Treasure. The internet is awash with sermon illustration stories about tithing. Tons of jokes. Apparently it's good to lighten the mood a little bit when you're giving the message that's uh, as uncomfortable as money. But I have a couple modest examples here. Pastor to congregation, I have some good news and some bad news. The good news is that the church has tons of money. The bad news is that it's still in your pockets. <laughs> Sunday school teacher to students, do you know where little boys go when they don't put their money in the collection plate? Little Bobby says, they go to the movies. Why does a $20 bill look so small at the grocery store, but so big at church? These kind of illustrate general truths about giving, but none of them comes close to the supernatural wisdom of Jesus in Matthew 6.1, 6, where he says, 
For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If you take the words of Jesus seriously, and not just as a vacation Bible school platitude, you must ask yourself, where is my heart? Is it at the mall? Is it in your house? Is it in your beach house? Is it parked in your garage? Is it in your guitar cases at home, Scott Bacon? <laughs> Is it at a bar or a casino? Stored up in a bank somewhere? Is your treasure spent in a righteous pursuit? In a covetous one? Are you proud of your answers? And what do you have to show for this? Do you have more stuff? Do you have love? When is enough stuff enough? So when you do give to the church, do you still find, you ask, find yourself asking, what is in it for me? Well, for Simon the Sorcerer, instead of more magic, what was in it for him was a lesson about the power and the mysteries of the Holy Spirit. All of his money could not buy the Holy Spirit, not just because the Holy Spirit is not for sale, but because his motives were ungodly. God does reward cheerful giving. Malachi 3.10 says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so there may, be, there may be food in my house and test me now on this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. We offer him our lives, our work, our savings. The stuff that we get back might not be what we wanted or expected. God's payback is far more righteous than our selfish desires. But tangible or intangible, he will always give us the right thing. Let's pray. Please, Lord, may your Holy Spirit inspire us to try to be like you. Your magnificent generosity and your righteous ways. Help us to put our faith into action in honorable works and cheerful giving. And in giving, let us remember what you have done for us. You gave us your only son. You saved us. You bless us daily. Let us gratefully return to what to you what is rightfully yours.